provides information about Earth's structure and seismicity with unprecedented resolution. In addition to the core areas of expertise, he's also working on and publishing high-performance computing, medical ultrasound imaging, effective media and metamaterial material design, and non-destructive testing. He's also the receiver of a couple of outstanding awards, including the 2011 Archeo Awards. Now, without further ado, I would like to hand this over to um, Andreas. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction, for the invitation. And um, so before I start, I would like to say that this is by no means my important work, because as you can see, I have quite a few clips of many, many students, postdocs, and colleagues all, all over the globe. So I will start with the picture that you see here. This is actually me carrying a fiber optic cable through the Alps. And uh, so, so interestingly, this picture was one of the top 10 pictures, science pictures in Science Magazine last year, and so, so apparently people liked it. And, uh, and so between the ridge on which I'm walking and the high mountains that you see in the background, there's the Rhone Glacier, which is one of the iconic glaciers of the Alps. And we deployed this fiber optic cable. We, we laid it out on that glacier. And what I want to show you in the next 45 minutes or so is uh, why we actually did that, why this is useful, why this tells us something about the glacier itself. Work. Let's see. Okay. So, so what are the objectives of uh, of this presentation? Um, the first thing I want to do is I want to show you how fiber uh, optical fibers, fiber optic cables, can be used as deformation sensors in seismology. What's the what are the measurement principles? How does this actually work? And what are the uh, the advantages and disadvantages? of this technology. So, so no technology is the silver bullet. So what is the niche in which those technologies actually work well? And, uh, and then I want to show you how this can actually provide some, some geophysical insight, especially in cases where dense arrays of standard seismometers can't be deployed or would be very expensive to deploy. Uh, the, the talk roughly falls into two parts. The first longer one will present a couple of case studies using a technology that is called uh, distributed acoustic sensing. So the emphasis here is on distributed. And the focus will be on volcanic and glacial environments. So environments that are traditionally challenging for, for seismological studies. And the second part will be on an emerging class of technologies that in contrast to distributed sensing are called integrated sensing. I will tell you what that is and where the potentials of this technology actually lie. So let's get started with the, with the first part. Uh, and this is on, on this technology or on uses of this technology called distributed fiber optic sensing. So this is how it should be called, but in fact, mostly it's called distributed acoustic sensing, which is a misnomer because of course you can't only sense acoustic waves, but you can sense elastic waves or all sorts of other deformation phenomena, but this is how it entered into the literature. It's, it's not going to go away, even though it's a misnomer. So how does this work? The, the idea is, is very simple in principle. So what you have, you have a so-called interrogation unit. And this interrogation unit is a fancy laser interferometer. So what it does is it sends a laser pulse into an optical fiber. So a thin 10 micrometer thick glass fiber. And those, uh, those fibers, unfortunately, in a way, uh, they are not perfect. So as uh, just as regular window glass, right, it's, it's not perfect. If you make the glass thicker, you won't transmit all the light. And, uh, and that is because those optical fibers have teeny tiny imperfections. So randomly distributed scatters. Now, when this pulse travels through this fiber, each time it hits one of those scatters, a tiny fraction of the, uh, of the energy is scattered back into this laser interferometer. So, and what this interferometer does, it measures essentially the travel time of the backscattered pulse. And from that, you can basically reconstruct where in the fiber this, this scatterer is located. But that's not interesting. What is interesting is what happens when you deform the fiber. Because when you deform the fiber, those little scatterers, they move a teeny tiny bit. And so, so their position may change from L to L plus delta L. And so somebody's connecting, good to see. Um, I hope you can. Okay. 
Shall we try again? The Piper being kicked out of Zoom? Um, yeah. Let me check. Sure. So the internet is alive. Um, yes. I'll, I'll 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 try once more. I think I dis I I quickly disconnect this so I see my own screen, yeah. and uh, then we give it another chance. Yeah, I think you just disconnect it from the Oh, so he was he was connected to the Wi-Fi just now, but for some reason he was yeah, kicking out. out. Um, did you did I verify? No, oh, I don't think. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. I didn't manage. Oh, wait, he... I didn't manage to get in. Let me use my student account. Or yeah, just confirmation. Okay, so let's uh, should be online. Let's give it another shot. Share screen. The PowerPoint. No, you can't. You can't see it. Um, okay, you just not do that. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Okay, okay. now it works. Okay, good. Good, let's see if this, uh, if this works. So yeah, so so then the, the interesting thing happens when the fiber actually deforms, because then those tiny scatters, they move a little bit. And uh, and as a consequence, the uh, the travel time of the next backscattered pulse is slightly changed. And this laser interferometer can measure those teeny tiny time delays that you get from this deformation. And, uh, and the measurement accuracy is high, simply because the speed of light in the fiber is very high, and you can repeat this experiment many, many times during a certain time interval. And typical interesting time intervals in seismology, they're, they're fractions of a second. So in a fraction of a second, you can do this many, many times. So what does this give us? What this, was this the result? The result is that, uh, that we can turn this fiber essentially into a long line of seismometers. So typical, typical measure, spacings of measurement points or channel spacings are down to 25 centimeters. And the cables can be tens of kilometers long. So just imagine you have a 10 kilometer long cable and you have a channel spacing every meter, you suddenly have 10,000 seismometers which is way more than we would ever hope to deploy uh, before the advent of this technology. So what are the potentials of this distributed acoustic sensing or DAS? Obviously, the very high spatial resolution at very low cost. Um, what is also cool, you can actually use pre-existing cables. So I will show some examples before. You can use cables, fiber optic cables, that haven't been deployed for us seismologists, but for people who want to do telecommunication. So for you, you want to use a mobile phone. Um, and in some cases, and I will show some of those, uh, deploying your own cable and coupling it to the earth is actually pretty easy. So this brings me to this, to this first example that, uh, that I mentioned, uh, that, that I want to show you, which is actually from the Rhone Glacier. So relating to the, to the opening picture that I've shown you. Uh, so this is a bit sad what you see here. Uh, so the Rhone Glacier, it's, it's basically in front of our door. Uh, from where I live, it's, it's one hour driving. In 1850, it looked like this. So it one, was one of the biggest glaciers in the Alps. 
In 2010, it was like this. And when we went there several times a few years ago, this whole part here, it had turned into a lake. Uh, so it's receding quickly, which makes it a very interesting, but as I said, also pretty sad uh, natural laboratory. So the, the glacier is about eight kilometers long from, from top to bottom. And at the, at the lower part, so within the ablation zone, so where the glacier basically melts, uh, we deploy two kinds of instruments. The first instruments that we deployed were three seismometers. So we put them, so these are the, the black triangles that you see there. And installing three of those seismometers and actually coupling them reasonably well to the ice, orienting them, and so on and so forth, this took us about an hour. So this is important to know because we also deployed a fiber optic cable. This is this triangle, which was one kilometer long. And that took an hour as well. We just covered it with a little bit of snow. And, uh, and within that hour, that basically gave us 1,000 seismometers distributed along the cable. Yeah, so three versus 1,000 in one hour. So, so then uh, we were curious if this actually measures anything at all. So this was one of our pilot experiments in such a glacial environment. We didn't know if it would work, uh, but it actually records quite a lot. And some of the stuff that it records, uh, I want to show you here. So on those pictures, you always see two wiggly lines. The, uh, the black one, it's hardly distinguishable, the black one is the lower one. This is from this distributed acoustic sensing. There you measure strain rate in nano strain per second or meter per meter per second, nanometer per meter per second. And the top one uh, in gray, this is one of the seismometer recordings. This is millimeter per second. So displacement velocity of the surface of the glacier. And they're slightly shifted in time just that they're more easily visible. They actually occur at the same time. So, and what you see here is that uh, qualitatively they look the same. What you see marked here in R, this is so-called Rayleigh wave. This is a surface wave in, a, in an elastic medium. And uh, they're not the same wiggle by wiggle uh, because the lower one is a strain rate and the upper one is a velocity. So these are two different physical quantities, huh? but qualitatively you see they're the same. So what is this? Uh, it's the recording of a surface ice quake. So this is when a crevasse opens near the surface of the glacier. And that produces those surface waves predominantly. This is an explosion that we fired. Um, so there you see different kinds of waves. The little one that is marked here with a P, this is a compressional wave that travels to the bottom of the glacier, it's reflected upwards. And the large one in R was marked R, these are again radio waves. So th this explosion is nicely recorded. Um, this is a rockfall. So, so it, this was uh, springtime. So you have lots of rockfalls all the time uh, onto the glacier. And, uh, and we basically were sitting there and we noted when those rockfalls occurred. And it actually turns out that with those kinds of signals, you can retrospectively locate those rock faults. But what we were actually interested in are these creatures. This is the so-called stick-slip ice quake that was recorded on both the seismometers and this fiber optic cable. See two different kinds of waves. P waves are again the compressional waves, and S waves, these are shear waves. So what is the stick-slip ice quake? So these are ice quakes that occur at the interface between the bedrock and the overlying ice. And traditional theory in glaciology tells us that those things should not exist. So traditional theory is that glaciers flow and don't deform in a brittle fashion. So, so this was really a new phenomenon that was discovered. It's a new deformation mode of glaciers. Uh, so this is very interesting if you want to model the evolution of those glaciers. Um, so then we tried to locate those stick slip ice quakes. And we did this exercise twice. We did it with the three seismometers that we had in the corners of this triangle and with this dust cable. So if we do it with those three seismometers, we get lots of possible locations of those ice quakes. And all the possible locations of one of those ice quakes is shown in green. So you basically see that with just three stations at the glacier, you, you can't say where this ice quake came from. Right? But if you use those 1,000 sensors on the cable, you can constrain the location of this ice quake to this little point cloud. So you get really uh, very significantly improved location accuracy for those ice quakes. What is interesting that during the deployment, which was about a week, we recorded 48 other ice quakes, and they were 
almost exactly identical. So the waveforms that we recorded, they produce correlation coefficients that are for all practical purposes one. So, to, so you see like every couple of hours, you see an exact copy of this earthquake. And, uh, and they all belong to the same to the same patch that you see down there. And, and also that was completely new to us. So small preliminary conclusions on this on this example. The most important thing for us was that we can actually deploy those cables on the glacier. So the Swiss military, they were nice enough to, to fly us up on the glacier with a the helicopter. They transported our equipment. They were very happy that they didn't have to fly concrete blocks around, but scientists, that was much more exciting for them. Uh, and just covering the cable with a little bit of snow provides very good coverage, uh, very good uh, coupling to the to the glacier and very good data quality. And uh, and so with the similar logistical effort, we can improve the location accuracy of those ice quakes very, very substantially. So what are the opportunities? It's mostly for understanding the dynamics of those glaciers, specifically in the context of climate change. So then we became a little bit more courageous and uh, and set up an experiment in Iceland on a volcano called Grimsvötum. What you see here, this is the ash plume of this volcano during its last major eruption in 2011. This ash plume was about 15 kilometers high. So it's not a, it's not a toy volcano, it's a very serious one. Um, so Grimsvötum is interesting for, for many, many different reasons. So it is located under Europe's biggest glacier called Vatnajökull. And um, and it's one of the major Icelandic volcanoes. So in terms of both eruption volume on a, on a, on a centennial time scale, but also in size. So what you see here, this this Mickey Mouse shape, this is the outline. This is the outline of the caldera, and uh, and the diameter of this caldera is ten kilometers. So my hometown Zurich fits completely into the caldera of that volcano. Um, there's something else interesting with this volcano. So the, the, the volcano has an elevation of about 2000 meter and, and this ice sheet is, is flowing across it. And so what happens is that the volcano heats the ice from below and it produces a fluid lake. And the fluid lake at times can have a depth of about 300 meters. And so it's a serious water level. Yeah? So this, this thing has 10 kilometer diameter and imagine 300 meters water underneath. It's a, it's, it's a huge volume of water. And that produces a high hydrostatic pressure. And when that pressure becomes too high, because you have too much meltwater, the rim of the caldera actually breaks. And then this huge volume of water, it, it drains, it flows under the glacier towards the coast. And that destroys bridges, roads, infrastructure, agriculture, and so on and so forth. So it's a pretty serious hazard. Uh, so you have this, you know, you have, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon because it's basically, if, in a way, if a, a volcanic hazard that is very serious and that comes without actually having a volcanic eruption. So, so volcanoes do many other things. They don't just erupt. Um, so we deployed a fiber optic cable of about 12 kilometer length. This is the black dash line that you see here. It goes halfway around the caldera and then to its central point. And at the beginning, this was really blue sky research. Do we record anything at all? And, and what could one possibly do with those recordings? So, so these are some, some impressions of the, uh, of the deployment. These are, these are some of my students. So if you, if you think that studying physics is too boring, huh? it's never too late. Uh, so, so the colleagues in Iceland, they, uh, they invented for us a trenching sled. So it's the sled that you see here. And, uh, and the fiber optic cable, it goes into a plow at the surface. So it goes into the plow, goes to 50 centimeter depth under the ice, and it comes out under the ice. And uh, let's see if the video plays. But these are, these are two of my students sledding. Um, and in front of the sled, there's one of those piston bullies that you have uh, on, the, on the ski slopes to prepare the ski slopes. And this is the cable drum. Right. And like this, we deployed 12 kilometers of cable in one day, which is pretty, pretty fast. If you wonder what the oil barrel is there, it's, it's not that we needed the oil, we just needed weight. So otherwise, the, the sled would just be kicked out of the ice. Um, right, so also here, so some field work impressions. 
all this thing here is the caldera. You see this to the right. And the cable roughly followed the laser pointer. So it went like this all the way around, and then it went into the center of the caldera. So these are two research huts that magically uh, survived all eruptions since 1956. Um, uh, over there, we had our equipment installed, and that's where we slept. And of course, the Icelanders built an extra hut for a volcanically heated sauna. So this is really, really cool. Um, this is the central point of the caldera. And this is an example of what we recorded. So this is what this kind of fiber optics data actually looked like. Uh, so it's a chunk of data. It's 40 seconds long from May 7th, 2021. On the x-axis, we have time. And on the y-axis, we have distance along the cable. So we look at the last four kilometers from 8 to 12 kilometer distance that's located inside the caldera. And the colors are strain rate. Yeah, so, so we are looking at deformation that is roughly plus minus 40 nano strain per second. So nanometer per meter per second. So these are tiny deformations that you record. And, uh, and this creature that you see here, the dominant one, this is a small volcanic earthquake. And, uh, and of those, we recorded around 1,000 per week. And this is roughly 100 times more than the colleagues in Iceland recorded with their regional seismometer network in the area. So, so these are interesting because, uh, because we can actually locate them and we can estimate their magnitude. And this is what you see here. So, so you'll see one, a movie uh, to the left. This is a top view, a map view. And center and right, these are the side views into the Earth. And, uh, and each dot corresponds to the location of, of one of those volcanic events. The black is the, is the outline of the cable. And so this is what this looked like. And uh, I want to point you to this, to this structure here. So you see over time, many, many little quakes that basically cross the caldera rim. And this is exactly what I mentioned before. So you have the water level that produces high hydrostatic pressure, and that puts the caldera wall under stress, and this produces those ice quakes. Okay. So uh, actually, a few months later, uh, the caldera wall broke through, and there was one of those flooding events. Right, so, and this is basically what you can anticipate using this kind of data, which is something that before you would never have seen. OK. But there's something else here. So, uh, so when you look closely, there's this funny background oscillation. Here. Yeah? So it's, it's almost exactly monochromatic at 0 0.22 hertz. And, uh, and it's there inside the caldera, not on the rim, and it's there all the time. So at the beginning, we thought this is, this is rubbish, but it's actually not. So when you compute the spectrum of this oscillation, the average over all the measurement point, points, you get this. So the colors, so each, each of those wiggly curves is the, the spectral amplitude, amplitude, amplitude of this oscillation as a function of frequency for different times of the day. So the black curve is from midnight to 1 a.m. Uh, and the, the light gray one is from noon to 1 p.m. And you see that over time, the amplitude of this background oscillation basically doesn't change. It's constant. And, uh, and what is really interesting here is that even though this is a very complicated geologic system with complicated mechanics and many phenomena, you can actually approximate this spectral amplitude almost exactly with the spectrum of a one-dimensional harmonic oscillator it has an attenuation factor of about 10. So, and what you actually see is you see the eigenfrequency of the ice sheet. So you have the, the lake and the ice sheet is sitting on top of it. And all of those little volcanic ice events that you have, all of those, those earthquakes, they excite the eigen oscillations of this ice sheet. And then it starts to resonate at its natural frequency, which is 0 0.22 hertz. Yeah, so this is basically what you have in a cartoon. So uh, basically, every five seconds or so, the whole thing moves half a meter up and down. So the interesting thing here is that essentially you have a, you have a natural amplifier, a natural loudspeaker. Yeah, so so it's this 
this background noise that this volcano produces. It's not something that we would be able to record because those events are way too small, right? But they excite the eigen oscillation and then you get this amplified signal that otherwise you would not see. And so this is uh, the, the biggest loudspeaker on Earth, if you will. And so what are the conclusions here? So we saw that this uh, DAS deployment it by far outperforms the, the regional seismometer array. Uh, we can detect lots of high frequency earthquakes a hundred times more than the, the seismometers in the area. And we also see this interesting phenomenon of this ice sheet resonance. There's, there's not much to do with it practically. It's just cool. Yeah, it's just an interesting natural phenomenon. So this brings me to part two, which is on those emerging integrated fiber optic sensing technologies. And the first the question is, well, why would one actually develop another technology now that this DAS is actually so successful? And I want to show you, you know, why that is useful and what it does uh, using a different experiment that we ran in Athens a few years ago. So a few words about the motivation. Uh, the, the big, the, the two disadvantages of this distributed acoustic sensing, the first one is sheer cost. And so a good interrogation unit, so one of those laser interferometers, costs about 200,000 euros. So it's an expensive exercise. Yeah? So you can't have many of those. Um, but also, the interrogation distance is limited. Yeah? So the length of the cable of the fiber that you can have. And the reason is very simple. You're using backscattered light that has a low amplitude from the outset. And then as it travels, it attenuates. Right? And after a certain distance, you're left with noise. And so typical maximum interrogation distances are about 40 kilometers. And this number has a very important consequence, which is that you cannot cross ocean basins. Yeah. And this is the holy grail of seismology, making measurements in the oceans. Yeah. So, And this is what we would like to do. And with that technology, we can't, because oceans are bigger than 40 kilometers. So the idea of this integrated fiber optic sensing is not to use backscattered pulses, but to use transmitted pulses. So it's very simple. You have a you have a fiber. You send some laser signal in. On one end, you receive it. On the other end, and that laser signal has a phase that is a function of time. Then you deform the fiber by whatever earthquakes, anthropogenic activity, whatever deforms it. And this deformation of, of, of an optical fiber has two consequences. The obvious one is it becomes longer or shorter. Yeah, so the travel time changes because you change the length. The other one is the so-called photoelastic effect, which means that if you deform a fiber, you change the speed of light. So and the two collaborate. And as a consequence then of deformation, you have a tiny phase change. Delta phi is a function of time. Right? And that you can measure. So if you do a little bit of math, uh, it's, actually, it's actually pretty simple. You find that to first order, so when this deformation is small, like in the micrometer, nanometer range, as we have seen before, this phase change is actually proportional to the integral of strain along the fiber. Kind of intuitive. So th this has an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage is that what we have just seen before with this distributed acoustic sensing, this is strain along the fiber. So we basically measure the integrant. So this means that for purposes of comparison, we can take our DAS measurements, simply integrate them along the line, and then we can synthesize literally those integrated measurements. Yeah. So, um, so if, if, if another measurement technology directly produces this integrated measurement, we have a quantitative comparison and can figure out if it actually works. Um, but the, the disadvantage is that you only produce one single time series. Yeah? Not one every meter, just one for the whole fiber. So it looks like you're losing this valuable spatial resolution. Yeah. So the first system that, uh, that was developed specifically for this purpose uh, was actually built by colleagues in Athens, so from, from several universities in Athens. We bumped into them accidentally. We actually wanted to run another experiment in Athens using a telecommunication cable. And the telecom company, they have a lab, and they put them in the same lab as us. So very, very nice coincidence. 
and uh, and we we both interrogated two different fibers in one cable, the same cable, that was about forty kilometers long and traversed the northern suburbs of Athens. And uh, and what they built is essentially also a laser interferometer that uses microwave frequencies. So it's a it's a modulated laser signal um, that uses that it's it's modulated to microwave frequencies. And the cool thing about this is that they literally built this from eBay from from eBay stuff. Yeah, so it's up up to electronics they literally bought on eBay for six thousand euros, not two hundred thousand. Yeah. And uh, so I, I was just blown away. I saw this anti-vibration table and they had all this stuff connected on the table and magically that records something. So, so then we were lucky and a relatively big earthquake occurred. So, uh, so this is a magnitude 6.3 earthquake that occurred near Crete. It's about 300 kilometers south of, uh, of Athens. And this is the recording that we made with our distributed acoustic sensing interrogator, again, time on the on the x-axis distance distance on the y-axis and the colors are straight red and uh, and then what we did is we simply integrated this image in the vertical direction vertical direction along the line and then we synthesized the actual integrated measurements that the colleagues made with their six thousand euro interrogator and this is what the, the comparison looks like so the blue is the actual integrated microwave sensor. And in orange, this is the integral of our distributed acoustic sensing. You see, for a 6,000 euro prototype, this is pretty good. If you look at it in a higher frequency band, this is from 0 0.05 to 0.1 hertz, this 0.125 hertz, it still matches basically wiggle by wiggle. It's, it's not perfect, yeah, but, uh, but for a prototype, this is pretty remarkable. So, uh, so it's a promising comparison. This, that system just works, and it's fifty times less expensive than it does in Terabyte. Yeah. So you apparently lose special spatial resolution, but you may be able to compensate this by just having many of those. Yeah. And with this integrated sensor, you can interrogate cables that are thousands of kilometers long. So you can cross ocean basins. So some preliminary preliminary conclusions here. So we have this uh, integrated fiber optic sensing that can overcome the limitation of limited interrogation distance is based on transmitted laser signals. And uh, with that, we can look at remote regions, the Arctic ocean basins. And this microwave prototype, yeah, it's just, it just works remarkably. So, but there's this downside of not having distributed sensing capability. And uh, in the next couple of slides, I want to show you if there's actually something we can do about this. This is theory. It's it's not proven. It's, it's we, we've never shown this in, in in example. So, is there anything we can do to obtain spatially distributed information from those integrated measurements or from the single time series? And it turns out you can. If you do a little bit of math, it's just you know slightly more involved integration by parts. You can transform this equation above that we've seen before, that this time-dependent phase change is the integral of strain along the fiber. You can turn this into this integral, which shows you that this phase change is the integral over the local curvature of the fiber times displacement of the fiber. So these are exactly the same. So what does it mean? What, what are the implications of this second equation? I want to show you what the implications are in a little toy example. The toy example goes as follows. We have a, a two-dimensional Earth. That's basically a few hundred kilometers by a few hundred kilometers. And in that Earth, there occurs an earthquake that's at the location of the Black Star. I simulated this, so it's not, not real data. And for simplicity, this is just an acoustic wave. So you see a single wave front that is propagating through the medium. And this wave deforms two different fibers. So the first fiber shown in red, uh, shown in black, is about two thousand kilometers long. It's this, it's this sinusoid, and so it has relatively low curvature, but it's long. The second cable is only a thousand kilometer long. It's the red one, but it has a higher curvature. It has twice the curvature, half the length. So and then the wave 
deforms both fibers. So on this plot, we see this recording for the black fiber. So the first thing that you see is that even though here you have a single wave front, you have two sets of wiggles in this recording. And this has to do with the fact that your measurement sensitivity, if you will, is proportional to the curvature of the fiber. So one of those early wiggles here corresponds to this high curvature point here of the sinusoid. Right? So this is the closest high curvature point of the fiber to the source. Yeah? So when this wave hits this high curvature point, it uses one of those early wiggles. Yeah? Then another wiggle is produced when you hit the next high curvature point and so on and so forth. Right? So each time one of the high curvature points of the sinusoid is hit, you produce an additional wiggle in the time series. Now those those wiggles they, they they overlap and so on and so forth. Yeah, but in the end they produce two different sets of wiggles apparently, corresponding to different sets of uh, of high curvature points that the uh, the wave hits. Now look, let's look and at at the second fiber that produces the red wiggles that you see here. Same phenomenon, even though you have only wave one wave front, you produce two sets of wiggles, again, coming from the wave hitting different sets of high curvature points. The other interesting thing here is that uh, the amplitudes are actually the same. Right? So order of magnitude, the amplitudes of those waves are about one hertz. So the, the amplitude is measured in hertz, right? It's a, because it's a phase, phase per time. And it's, it's roughly the same for both. So, and that is because according to this equation, the red fiber, yeah, it's only half as long, so your integral becomes shorter, but has twice the curvature, and it compensates each, each other. Yeah? So you can make high amplitude measurements, so basically get above the noise level, increase signal-to-noise ratio by having a curvature that is stronger. Good. So the strongly curved fiber segments, they are more sensitive to deformation, and they produce individual distinguishable wiggles. So let's drive this a little bit further. We zoom into this figure that we've seen here before. So this is just the same recording. We zoom in, and then we do a little numerical experiment. So we ask a very simple question. We, we pick one of those time windows here. Let's, let's call it time window A, marked in, in, in gray, shaded in gray. And we ask the question, how do I have to change the wave speed in my two-dimensional Earth such that I change the arrival time of that wave? And this question is being answered by this, this cigar-shaped creature that you see here. This is a so-called sensitivity kernel. It's, it's literally an integral kernel, but it's, that's, that's not so interesting here. So what is interesting here is that when you change the wave speed within that colored area, then the wave, the wiggle in this window arrives earlier or later. Right? If you change wave speed anywhere else in this two-dimensional Earth, nothing happens. Yeah. So, And there you see, interestingly, that this sensitivity kernel connects the source location to one of those high curvature points, right? which again confirms that the individual wiggles are produced by the wave hitting different high curvature points along that cable. Well, we can continue that game and just pick a different time window. So where in the Earth do I have to change the wave speed in order to change the arrival time of that part of the wave packet? Well, and out comes, is it, this just died. Um, And out comes this, this sensitivity distribution. Yeah? So if you analyze the travel time in the in window B, you see a different part of the Earth. And then you can continue this. Um, right, so if you pick a time window C, you again see a different part of the Earth. Time window D, you see yet another part. Yeah? So that basically means we can, in a way, synthesize distributed measurements. And we can obtain spatially distributed information by making time-dependent measurements. 
Yeah. So, so we can mimic a distributed system, even though we have a single time series from an integrated system. And so we can, in a way, we can deintegrate. So, yeah. So conclusions from this theoretical exercise: uh, measurement sensitivity is proportional to local fiber curvature. A perfectly straight fiber records nothing. Um, you can uh, mimic effectively distributed measurements by time-dependent analysis. And we think that this has a lot of potential to study, to do tomography of the Earth, so to image the internal structure of the Earth, but also to discover seismic sources, to constrain seismic sources, the properties of earthquakes. And this is what I want to show you in the last chapter. So this last chapter is about yet another sensing technology, but in a way, but it still produces integrated measurements. Yeah, just the measurement principle is slightly different. It's not based on microwaves. Uh, it's based on a technology that is called active phase noise cancellation. And uh, even though you, you may not be aware of it, but all of you already know what phase noise cancellation is, and some of you are using it every day. So how does this work? So, so the setting is as follows. Um, in Switzerland, and I'm sure also in the UK, there is a national metrology lab. No, it's not meteorology, it's metrology, it's the science of time, of measurements. And in that lab, which is located in Bern, the, the capital of Switzerland, they literally produce the official Swiss time. And, uh, and that time is produced by an array of nuclear clocks. They're, they're trying to synchronize them in the lab, but also with other labs. And this is nice and good, then they have this time signal in the lab. That's not where it's useful. So this time signal needs to get uh, to people who want to do high-frequency trading. It needs to go to the military. It needs to go to research labs and so on and so forth. So how does the time signal get to users? And very simple. It's transmitted through, fiber opti uh, through optical fibers. And so what they do specifically here is they have, uh, they produce many time signals. But the one that is interesting here for us, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a laser signal at a frequency of 190.7 terahertz. And, uh, and this is an ultra-stable frequency that carries the, the time information that they would like to transmit to users. And uh, in that specific case, it's supposed to go to a research lab that is located in Basel. That's in northern Switzerland on the border with Germany. And, uh, and the optical fiber that connects the two labs is 100. 23 kilometers long. So, and what then happens is that, uh, as I've explained before, when you deform the fiber through anthropogenic activity, earthquakes, industrial activity, and so, you know, whatever, you deform the fiber. And again, this has two consequences. Fiber changes length, and you change refractive index or speed of light, so this photoelastic effect. Bottom line is, as a function, as, as a consequence of deformation, you change this frequency. So those 190.7 terahertz by just some tens of hertz, and that is relevant. Yeah. So, and you need to correct for this, because otherwise, no useful signal arrives at the user's end. So, and they developed a technology that basically cancels this kind of noise that comes from deformation. So they produced, they built a noise canceling system. The electronics are shown here, but this is not what I want to explain to you. I want to explain to you something that you all in, understand intuitively because your headphones are conceptually doing exactly the same. And so what do those headphones have? They have, um, they have microphones outside and those microphones, they record the, the, the ambient noise that you don't want to hear. And then there's some electronics and those electronics practically in real time, they compute an anti-signal, anti-sound. And this anti-sound is transmitted through microphones to the inside. Right? It cancels the outside noise. And, uh, and that system is basically the same. Yeah? In real time, it computes an anti-frequency. And that anti-frequency is used to compensate for the uh, noise that is produced through the deformation of the fiber. And the whole system works simply because the time scales of this deformation yeah, much, much longer than the time scales of a pulse propagating those 123 kilometers. Yeah, so that's why you can do this in real time. 
And then you you again you do you can do a little bit of math and you find that this anti frequency which is being computed is proportional to the deformation of the fiber and in fact again proportional to the integral over deformation along the fiber. So then we were lucky. Uh, so the uh, the colleagues in Bern they uh, so usually they they throw this anti frequency away. It's not useful for them. Yeah. So what they did they literally just plugged a hard drive into their computer and recorded that anti signals was. And then we were lucky and an earthquake occurred. And that earthquake occurred uh, near Mulhouse in, in southern France. So this is again, uh, still doesn't work. So M Mulhouse is located uh, north of Basel, so where this, this white blue thing is located. And, uh, and in red, you see the geometry of this fiber with a zoom into Basel. We see this very complicated geometry. So that, that event occurred. And uh, what is interesting here for, for the rest of the story is, is what, what that, that blue-white thing is. So in, in seismology, we somewhat jokingly call this a beach ball. So this beach ball, or moment tensor solution, this is the radiation pattern of the earthquake. And so an earthquake acts like an antenna. Yeah, so an antenna radiates only in different directions, not in others. An earthquake does the same. An earthquake is a bit more complicated because actually it radiates different types of waves in different directions, but that's 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 not important here. So this beach ball characterizes the the mechanics of the earthquake, and that beach ball is interesting to us because knowledge of that beach ball allows me to infer could that quake produce a tsunami? Is that quake maybe a nuclear explosion? And many many other questions. Yeah, so, so there are many practical consequences that follow from knowledge or ignorance of that beach ball. So we, we are very, very interested in that creature. So the, well, then this earthquake occurred. Here you see a numerical simulation of that earthquake using a, a numerical technique called the spectral element method. It's very popular in seismology. It's a finite element method that's particularly well suited for, for wave propagation problems. And that wave propagates through that fiber and deforms it. And then, yeah, we were lucky that it actually it, it actually was recorded. And what you see here are two two sets of curves. Um, the uh, the black curves, these are the actual observed anti-frequency that was computed. Now remember, the actual frequency that is being transmitted is something like 190 terahertz, and the anti-frequency has amplitudes of a few tens of hertz. Yeah, so a teeny tiny fraction of the of the frequencies that you're actually transmitting, and uh, and then we try to simulate this, so using this the spectral element uh, simulator, and this is what is shown in red. Yeah, and there you see, even though we don't know the structure of the Earth perfectly in that region, it reproduces the observed wiggles pretty well in different frequency bands. So to the left you see the different frequency bands where, where we're looking. So what you see is that this, this phase noise cancellation system it actually performs pretty accurate measurements of a phenomenon for which it has not at all been constructed. Uh, so we are piggybacking on a technology with you know, zero cost for us, and it's a seismometer. So then back to the speech ball. So those speech balls, they are being estimated routinely. Yeah, so... Uh, response. So you see this beach ball again here. And uh, and th this beach ball is estimated routinely using seismometers in the region. So these are all the black triangles. And all of those black triangles, they produce three component recordings of this wave field, the three orthogonal directions. And uh, and this is estimated by the Swiss Seismological Service, which is, you know, some, this, this is our geological service in Switzerland. And this is what it looks like for this um, what is earthquake? And this is what it looks like when we estimate it based on the single time series that we recorded. And they are within each other's error bars. And so with a single time series, we can actually reproduce the result that the Swiss Seismological Service produces with a whole array of seismometers. It's quite remarkable. So what we've seen is this active phase noise cancellation. It enables long-range deformation sensing. We don't have to interrupt the metrological service, which is nice. It's 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 really a, a free byproduct. Nobody suffers, uh, and there's no additional effort except plugging a hot disk into a computer. 
Uh, we can match those wave field recordings and we can invert for this moment tensor, so for the speech ball. So what are opportunities here? It's seismology in sparsely covered regions, oceans, Arctic, others. Um, but also we think seismic imaging, earthquake studies, or tsunami, nuclear monitoring, and so on and so forth. So this brings me almost to the end of my talk. I have a teeny tiny bit of bonus material because this is just a, you know, the, the right time for it. And this bonus material comes from Iceland. So uh, I'm, I'm sure all of you are aware of this, this uh, volcano seismic crisis that is going on in Iceland. Uh, it's in the, on this, the southwestern tip of Iceland. This is called the Reykjanes Peninsula, historically known for, for being uh, volcanically active. To the right, you see some data collected by the Icelandic Met Office. And uh, the colors that you see, they are a, a vertical displacement of the surface within one day from November 10th to 11th. The scale is plus minus one meter. Yeah, plus minus one meter in one day. Uh, so this is uh, enormous. Uh, this produced lots of earthquakes. Uh, here you see, to the right, you see some of them. Uh, they very nicely follow this uh, this dike, this, this eruption dike. That At that time, there was no eruption yet, but it was already very clear where, where it would happen. To the left, this is the town of Grindavik. This, uh, this rupture, it went straight through the gym of the local school. Um, the, the town, of course, is, uh, has been evacuated since, since November. So, and we were, we were kind of lucky. Uh, we have good colleagues in, in Iceland, and they allowed us to, uh, to connect one of our DAS interrogators to a telecommunication cable that runs from the Blue Lagoon. Maybe some of you noticed the tourist attraction in Iceland, uh, all the way to the, to the coast. So there, there's a, a typical Iceland thing. So they they really had total trust. They let my young PhD student into the geothermal power plant. There was nobody else. They just gave her the key, told her where the server room is, and asked her, just plug it in. <laughs> so she could probably have shut down the whole power plant. <laughs> uh, there was just total trust. So and and so then we since then we have been we have been recording uh, the deformation along on, on that fiber. And, uh, and there are some curiosities that you observe. Uh, for example, here, this is an earthquake quadruplet. So within a few seconds, you actually had four earthquakes. So two small ones, another small one, and then this huge one. And uh, we have tens of thousands of those. So it's, it's a huge, extremely valuable data set. Uh, because this is really the first time that we have such spatially dense data near such an eruption site that lasts over such a long time, migrates, and you know shows all sorts of phenomena. So if you're interested, we have a YouTube channel, and we are live streaming uh, those data on our on our YouTube channel. It's uh, it's hugely popular. Um, so uh, so and right now our YouTube channel has about 10 times as many subscribers as the YouTube channel of our biggest professional society, which is uh, we're very proud of this. <laughs> so uh, right now, there's, there's not a lot going on. At the moment, it's quiet. Uh, but I remember a few weeks ago, during the last eruption, it was, uh, it was on a Sunday morning. Uh, we had my laptop on our breakfast table, and, uh, and my little kids, they were sitting, uh, sitting there having breakfast and watching the earthquake, which was really boom, boom, boom. So it's super impressive. And uh, but yeah, but right now it's a, it's a bit quiet. But in, still, if you're interested, take a look. And uh, yeah, that's all I have. Thanks for your attention. Very much, Professor Dixon, for this very interesting talk on optic fiber. Um, you you're probably all hungry and tired. <laughs> Ladies first. Very that um, the, the type of like you mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering if like I saw in your slide that you basically the interferometry to measure like the strain rate by measuring the phase change. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering how does the I didn't quite take a look at the numbers, but how does the strain compare to say one hit the time? Because don't you have to um well, say so I mean how the how does how the strain compares to 
to a wavelength of the actual optical signal. So how, so how, how by how much it changes, how, how the phase change compares to the actual optical signal. So it's a, it's a fraction of the wavelength of the optical signal for, for the uh, phenomena that we are interested in. Yeah, so, so for recording natural earthquakes, unless you're sitting right on top of it, uh, the, the deformation produces optical phase changes that are small enough to avoid cycle skipping, for example. Yeah, so, um, so we have examples where you produce cycle skipping or very large phase changes that those technologies can't handle. For example, if you hit a hammer next to the pipe. So, so then this this happens, but usually with the uh, those environmental applications, we are on the safe side. Uh, uh, I was wondering, a lot of the examples that you were showing were very close to the sensors. Do, does this have any applications in more global? Or <laughs> I would say not yet. Uh, so, um, so of course we record very distant, earth distant earthquakes. So for example, in the Iceland data set, we have, uh, earthquakes that occurred in Japan and in China and they're being recorded. Uh, no, no problem. Uh, if, uh, if they're installed sufficiently well, so far, it does not, it does not help us a lot because the, uh, the global seismic network is actually very good. So, so, you know, at, at this moment, uh, you know, there are order of magnitude 10,000 seismic stations scattered around the globe that are recording. Yeah. And typically, uh, those places where you have seismometers are the ones where you have uh, those stars interrogators. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, that means not in developing countries, not in the oceans, not in the Arctic, not in Russia, not in India. Uh, so, uh, and uh, you had them in China, but the data, data don't get out. So, and, um, and so I think it will start making a different difference when those technologies develop sufficiently to really allow us to cover the oceans. Then it will make a difference, right? So at the moment, those technologies are too immature, and uh, and the uh, the number of optical fibers in the oceans is it's not too small, but it's poorly distributed, right? So all the optical fiber optic cables. They follow the same, for example, from Europe to North America, they follow the same trajectory through the North Atlantic. And so you have lots of them, but no coverage. No, it's not. No, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's three-dimensional. Just my toy example was in 2D because I could calculate it quickly. So it was just a proof of concept. Yeah. yeah. Sorry? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I don't know enough about fiber optic technology. The only thing I can tell you is that at the moment, uh, there are no amplifiers that uh, that work with this technology. And so, so at the moment, with all the uh, available DAS interrogators that are out there, uh, we need an uninterrupted fiber, no amplifiers or nothing else in between. So apparently it disturbs the phase of the... Uh, Backscattered signals. Maybe maybe it doesn't even let the backscattered signals through. I think it, it, it might even defy the purpose of those amplifiers, yeah, because they should amplify amplify the forward propagating mode and attenuate the backward propagating. So they probably counteract what we would actually like. It's my guess. So so, but I know that uh, there are people develop looking into the development of basically backscattering amplifiers. That uh, that preserve the face and then would be useful with this kind of technologies. Uh, so it's it's this in principle sounds attractive, but I think the use is limited uh, because nobody will dive three thousand meter to three thousand meter water depth, disconnect the two fibers, and then put one of those amplifiers in between. So I think the practical implications would be small. 
With different? Different, uh, like um, is there an issue with it? Uh, there, it's not really an issue in the sense of a problem, right? So, uh, um, of, so here, so in the toy example, there was no issue because it's it was all acoustic waves, right? so so there, it was in a way it was all the same phase, but popping up at, at different times. Um, if you have elastic waves, so P waves and S waves then you can still execute this recipe. Right? So you have your recording and you can apply so-called adjoint techniques and they give you sensitivity kernels. So they would give you the sensitivity of that, of that wavelet with respect to shear wave speed, with respect to pre-wave speed, or maybe with respect to attenuation or some anisotropy, anisotropy whatever you're interested in. Yeah. So, uh, so just um, your sensitivity zoo becomes a bit more diverse yeah? and uh, and you would basically need to uh, it's in a way an optimal design problem yeah? you could try to figure out uh, which kind of measurement you want to make and which time window in order to be predominantly sensitive to a certain parameter that you're interested in so it becomes more complicated but it's not an issue I'm, I'm very interested in the point that you talk about on when ice quake happens, you mm -hmm. have resonant interaction. Mm -hmm. So you have like this resonant frequency of 0 0.2 gigahertz. Oh, it is, yes. Like Sorry? Is it kind of universal kind of frequency? Of no, the 0 0.22, uh, this is controlled by the geometry of the floating ice sheet. Oh. Yeah, so, uh, so if you, one can do more, more or less a back of the envelope calculation and uh, and take uh, basically a, a, a floating elastic me an elastic medium that is floating on that fluid medium and then calculate the eigenfrequency and then you find that the fundamental mode uh, the fundamental mode eigenfrequency is those the zero point two hertz. Yeah, so it's it's not it's not universal. It's uh, specific to the geometry of this of the system. So the system of this uh, the eigenfrequency kind of how geo or geoprocess to kind of um, study the period of glaciation of the earth. No, not really. So the the, the so this is uh, so these are completely different time scales. Yeah. So uh so you know glaciological phenomena, glaciation, retreat of glaciers, uh this has decadal time scales. Yeah. So there we ran an experiment um for a couple of weeks and uh and you see you see a much much smaller snapshot. So I think in order to really learn something about the glacial dynamics in this specific case, uh, one would need to run such an experiment for much longer. So with the limited amount of data, no. Uh, you have stamps and graves by the side of the photograph, so you have the graphs on here. Um, you can um, so thank you again. For thank you. Talk. I, I wouldn't be able to get my students into a lecture hall at that.